So my point is, why wouldn't we just look for exactly how we become conscious and intelligent in our formation? And then if it truly isn't something that just happens because all of these disparate things come together, then we might be able to take that and graft it onto a machine of our making. Well, you could argue that that's exactly what's just happened. Uh -oh. So if you, if you, well, look, I mean, if you look at the history of AI, 30 years ago, it, it, it now is, gets called GoFi, good old fashioned AI. And it was all about, we're gonna build a computer that can play chess using symbolic logic, checkers, we're gonna build expert systems that we're gonna inform with human understanding. And then this big shift took place in neural networks. And they said, you know what? We're not gonna to start top down. We're gonna start bottom up. And we're gonna start bottom up with a system that resembles a brain. And, and it's exactly, so they did exactly what you just said. They'll say, let's, let's just try and rebuild something that looks a bit like a brain with lots of units that are kind of like neurons, that are connected kind of like neurons. You have enough of them they'll do something interesting. So I would argue that this kind of biomimesis approach to intelligence that you're describing is, is, is the AI revolution of the current moment. Okay. All right, but, but I, I got to get to the bottom of something here. Let's bring back emergence into the conversation. We have, a, we have neurons that ostensibly are nicely suited for our survival. Okay, when we're hungry, we look for food. If there's danger, we escape it or fight it. And so the brain is doing its thing. And any creature has similar, any creature that similar, cares about similar living. Similar functionality yeah, in their exactly, brain. In their brain, in their brain. But we wanna say that we have consciousness as something beyond what we might ascribe to a plant. So what is going on inside of us, either in complexity or, from bottom up or top down that you can call consciousness. And the reason why I ask that in that way is everyone is making a big deal of consciousness today. And the fact that people are still writing books about it is evidence to me that we still don't know what it is. Because if we knew what it was, the last book would have been written and there'd be no <laughs> further books on the shelf. So, yeah. but everyone's talking about it like we fully understand it. And yeah. so, so can you give me some access to consciousness given your tools that you have built to ask questions. Yeah, I, I, I share your skepticism. <laughs> I think a lot of this is just baloney, um, the consciousness stuff, to be honest. And I think we really don't understand it. And hence, more and more terrible books being written on the topic. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Well, I think this is a good time for me to announce my forthcoming book, <laughs> The Last Book on Consciousness. <laughs> there are, well, you know this, there are just many schools of thought here. And in my world, most of the rigorous work, and I'm not saying it's great work, I'm just saying it's rigorous work, is looking for quantifiable metrics, measurements that correlate with the conscious state. So for, let me make that clear. So I measure your brain, right? I write down some equations, I calculate some number, and I measure your brain when you're sleeping, I measure your brain when you're awake and solving a problem, and I, me I measure your brain under anesthesia. And it turns out that that number that I calculated, I say, wow, look at that. That number's high when you're waking and solving a problem, and it's near zero when you're under anesthesia or sleeping. And so this is sometimes called the neural correlates approach to consciousness. I don't tell you what it is. It just says that there's some formalism that allows you, you to You found measure. a correlation. Right. You found a correlation, right? And, and maybe that's useful, right? If you go under anesthesia and you're gonna have your big toe removed, I'd rather that thing was near zero than at its maximum. So, but that's sort of the best of it. Um, when it comes to actually theories of what it is, honestly, qualitatively, it seems to be something about the tiny little attention window that the human brain has to operate on large sets of data. And just to be explicit about this, every mathematician knows that every hard problem is solved by their unconscious mind. Right? There is a very famous book written on this by someone called Hadamard, and it's called The Mathematician's Mind. And he interviewed everyone, he interviewed Einstein, Poincaré, looked at the journals of Gauss, 
And they all say the same thing. They say, you know, it's a really hard problem. The best thing I can do is think about it and then stop thinking about it. You know, I have a nice meal, I go for a run, whatever you do. And then somehow through some epiphany, the, the, the solution presents itself to me. I'm pretty sure Einstein didn't and, go on runs. i just pretty sure about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah he <laughs> plays the <a> violin. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he was no, a fitness <laughs> guru. <laughs> he smoked his pipe. You know, he did something in place of going for a he run. played his violin even. Yeah, sure. He plays his violin. He went walking with Kurt Gödel. You know, he did his thing. But the interesting point there is that, so consciousness is not about solving the hard problem. Um, it's about that little window of attention that is focused on some part of the problem. And um, most of the current formalisms don't really give us much of an insight into how that might work. So I, I actually do not like a lot of this stuff, to be honest. So in the, in the, I didn't read the book, but I saw the film I, Robot, which is based on the story by Isaac Asimov. Mm -hmm. The Will and, Smith one? Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> the Isaac Asimov one. But yes, Will Smith. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, the Will Smith story. Yes, the Will yes. Smith story. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the robots, all humanoid robots, there are these large vans that have robots that are not, that are decommissioned or that, yeah. but they're still kind of alive, but they just have no purpose until they're programmed for their utility to be your partner, to be your whatever. And in the van, the robots grouped with each other. They weren't just maximizing their distance and their pattern was not random. And someone asked about that. What do you know about this? And they said, we don't know what's causing this. What we do know is that there's a lot of residual programming that was never fully cleared out when we added new utility to these things. And this is exactly evolution, okay? There's leftover stuff right. in us yeah. from a time that we don't need it anymore, right. so what the hell is it doing in our head? It's the reason why sometimes I feel the need to eat flies. <laughs> <laughs> that explains it's your a lot. reptilian. <laughs> it's my reptilian it's your, brain. Your, your yeah. gecko just, brain. Yeah, exactly. Just going crazy. <laughs> so I was intrigued that th it was the leftover programming that was not refreshed in the continued evolution of humans, or in the case of those robots, the continued layering on to the functionality of them. And there's legacy software right. that you don't know what it's doing. So that was I, I was intrigued by that. I just want to share with you that observation. Yeah. I mean, again, I mean, a, a, a lot to talk about. And I think, you know, actually my colleague here, who you probably all know, um, who recently passed away, Cormac McCarthy, the novelist, he wrote a beautiful essay on this that he called The Kekulé Problem, which is about this moment of insight. And this was the discovery by Kekulé of the benzene ring. I say, like, oh my, oh, he saw it in a dream. And Cormac was fascinated as a writer, as a novelist, with this question of where is this coming from? I'm sitting down to write a, a book. And somehow my brain is instructing my hand that I couldn't tell you exactly what's going to happen at the end of that sentence. It's sort of coming out. And so he, over the course of time, introspectively, came to believe that he was getting these instructions from his unconscious mind. Now, I'm not in a mystical sense, just he wasn't working it out, right? And to your point, the, the, if you look at the history of life on Earth, most of evolution up until very recently took place without language. And presumably, most organisms being run by a set of automatic programs of the kind that you just described in the van with the robots huddling, like starlings. Mm. And that we superimposed above that this kind of very thin layer of abstraction um, and self-awareness. But most of the computation is not being done by that thin layer. And, and so, oh, yeah. That's very you know, okay. what, 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 yeah, what is true... That. Right, is that that little thin layer gives us one thing that we're not aware any an other animal can do. Yeah. Which means that we can communicate our understanding. Mm -hmm. They can communicate other things, but we can communicate our understanding. I can give you Newton's laws. I can tell you about Darwin's theory of evolution. Right? Mm -hmm. And that superpower of humans that comes from very few neurons, I imagine, right, sits on top of exactly all of that programming that evolution gave us over the course mm. of hundreds of millions wow. of years. Oh. So I got one last question for oh, you. Oh, but I've still got more. You, you no, no, we, 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 like, we, we're we, asking more questions. I'll sit and talk to myself then. <laughs> 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 we're, we're in rap mode. Uh, we're, we're in rap, not the MC no, I know kind what of rap mode. mode. Mean, yeah. We're in rap mode here. Mm -hmm. So I just have to go there because it's, it fascinates us all. 
Well, I think about it all the time. I can't speak for others. Can you estimate, based on your toolkit, how intelligent we are relative to how high intelligence can get in the universe? So oh, that, wow. are, are we smart enough to figure out how the universe works? Or are we just complete idiots and some higher alien is just going to come out and just look at us like we are earthworms in our capacity to deduce the nature of the world? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting. I mean, one of the areas I work on is on tools and artifacts. You know, the abacus, the sextant, the quadrant, the Rubik's Cube. Yeah, all here that comes good the stuff. Oh, okay, here comes the shelf. Here comes the Got my sextant here, and I've got three Rubik's Cubes up on the other shelf. Just show and tell. <laughs> you know, that's... We and I'm sitting on the abacus. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I mean, there's an important point in that, because human intelligence has always been about ingenious outsourcing to artifacts and tools, including mathematics, right? There, you could not calculate the orbit of a planet without conic sections or the calculus, right? And I think that, so I think human intelligence in that respect is unlimited uh, because we'll just continue to build tools that are kind of adjuncts to our capabilities. And what makes AI interesting- I just I want you add, to know that I can compute orbits with nice. this abacus. <laughs> nice, no, I love it. <laughs> no, I'm no, lying, the, the, I'm totally lying right there. Yeah, this is an authentic <laughs> Chinese abacus. Yeah, I can see, I can yeah. see that. Mm -hmm. But I think, so just to your point, I think that what's really, and I, okay, this is, I'll just tell you very quickly. I classify tools into two categories. One I call complementary cognitive artifacts. That's like a pencil or an abacus or a sextant. Mm. And there's another kind of tool that I call a competitive cognitive artifact. And that's like a GPS machine or a large language model, right? One of those sets, the complementary ones, makes you smarter. One of those sets makes you dumber, Ooh. okay? And I think it's, it's the choice of humanity Ooh. to decide what kind, of, <laughs> what kind of tool it wants to be dependent on. And so my fear now is we're outsourcing our capabilities to competitive artifacts and not to things like future abakai, which actually would make us smarter. Wow. Oh, I have time for my question. I've got. I, I don't know. I don't think so. Well, I'm asking it anyway. Go ahead, ask it. Come all on. Right. All, right, all right. So let the man David, ask his question. You said life is problem solving. So why has the universe created life and what is the problem it's trying to solve? Ooh. So I, you know, I can, I can tell you the horribly cynical answer to that question. Go on. Yes, please. This horribly cynical answer to that question is that life is the most efficient way of returning to thermodynamic equilibrium. Oh man, that's terrible. No, <laughs> that's <laughs> <laughs> because life is the most efficient generator of entropy. Right. And um, if you think about what we do when we build factories, and what we're essentially doing is we're turning ordered states into disordered states. And that the cynical answer to your question really is, is, is life is a kind of suicide by the universe. Yeah, I was about to say, what you, what you really just said is, it's all for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not true either. Because it's what we make it. Is there an However, answer that isn't yeah. cynical, just so as we can have it on a, <laughs> no, such no, a okay. downbeat? No, I, 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 know, like the, I, I like the cynical answer. Let's, no, I love it. And I think, and I think the, the non-cynical answer came from the sort of idealist philosophers and they said life was the universe way of knowing itself and that's Ooh. also true hmm. so that's the non-cynical version yeah All right. that's very poetic yes i like yes. that that, right. that that was uh cosmos 1980 okay. that, that was a major theme the, the life is a way for the universe to know, to itself. know itself yeah yeah mm.